try to overlook a rival. All eyes on me cause I got no competition. Now looking at an idol. You're doing long enough to pay for my attention. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to the episode of The Real Lifestyle. And we have my main man. <laughs> you guys hear me talk about him all the time. The award-winning architect, my homeboy, Kobe Cart. <laughs> Thank you, Isai. Thank you, my brother. How you doing, man? Now that you're here, I'm doing phenomenal. You know, <laughs> I, got, I got my world done. <laughs> so, number one, it's a pleasure having you here with your guys. Um, We've been on sites before, yeah. but this is unique and special because we're all together here for the first time in our studios. So thank you for coming over and spending some time with me. Hey, no problem. You got a you got a major operation here, man. Listen, I think that uh, in order to produce what we do on an ongoing basis, you need to have uh, a team of people that continuously supports and continuously builds up uh, the company. Uh, this company is made of many, many dozens of people mm. who put together the time and the effort. And this is really their platform. This is their future. Um, this is their office. This is their business that they run and manage on a daily basis. Mm. I might have started it in, back in 1996, but since then it's a completely different evolution of a business here in Miami. How did you start? Like, you said 1996. I wasn't so, even born yet. <laughs> well, I was born yet. Were I was, you? I was four years old. You were four? I was four. So you were born in 92. 92. So what happened is I, I grew up in Minneapolis, and I had my degree in environmental design, mm. um, which back then was not as relevant as it is today. That was my first degree from the Institute of Technology mm. at the university. Um, and then I got my degree in architecture from the Institute of Technology, University of Minnesota. Yeah. But what's interesting is that um, I was hired by a Florida firm that was building hotels and resorts in the Caribbean, mm. uh, specifically the British West Indies, St. Lucia, Grenada, Turks and Caicos, Jamaica, Bahamas, uh, even Mexico when it got hit by Hurricane Hugo in 1991 or 1992, we were there um, to rebuild it. Wow. So what's interesting is that I came from Minneapolis and I graduated with a degree and I took my registration exam as I was leaving Minneapolis. Um, I was 24 when I graduated. I took the test when I was 25. And then I came in 1988 to Miami which was a little different. It was yeah. Miami Vice, Scarface days back then. It was a little bit different. And so you, you was roaming the streets? I was. <laughs> uh, the Cleveland there was selling the most uh, Budweiser than anybody else. <laughs> but it was a little, uh, you know, shady. Mm. But it's interesting how things turn around. You know, back then, it was the cool place to be if you're a model. Yeah. All the models were here doing photo shoots and movies. Gianni Versace was buying um, a nice building on Ocean Drive to make it his own personal residence and go down the street and have a cafecito at the News Cafe. Um, so it was a different life. Um, and uh, uh, Chris Blackwell from Jamaica came in, bought some properties. But it's the recycling of the businesses here in Miami. And I'm optimistic about Miami. I'm optimistic about Florida. Mm. It's the only state in the lower 48 that is tropical or subtropical weather. Um, you and I have known each other now for a few years. Yeah. What you do is part of the fabric of the community. You work with existing product, you renovate it, you upgrade it. Some of it is existing, some of it is historic. And that's what makes it unique and special. Uh, the fabric of the buildings in the neighborhoods in Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach and 
Sarasota or Tampa, they're all made of neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods are different from one area to the next. They're different in the architecture, in the design, in the food, in the culture. Um, you know, you can have, you know, downtown Haiti mm, here, and you yeah. can have downtown Havana. A little Haiti. Um, you can have little Haiti. You can have... Um, and it's not just that you can have the communities, you know, you can say I'm from Port-au-Prince and you can be that. And then you have people who come from the north side of Haiti, which is all the resort and, and so forth. They they have their own district and their food and beverage. And you have, you know, people that come from Havana. They're different than people who come from Oriente, mm. you know, so you get that kind of a mix. Um, and then you get the Colombians and Venezuelans. They built a whole city on the west side of the airport for Doral right. with their own politics and politicians and food and culture. And the same thing if you go down to North Miami, North Miami Beach, the government that runs the, the city, the administration, the management, the politicians are all of the fabric of the community. And I personally love working in the city of North Miami, North Miami Beach, um, because it's an area that needs to be built up and rejuvenated as it was in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So what happens is that as time goes by, most of the buildings have already been built in Aventura, Sunny Isles Beach, Miami Beach. Yeah, they old, old buildings. Yes. Right. But places like North Miami, North Miami Beach, we have an area and fabric that we can build. And I believe that it's in the, it's the hole in the donut, you know? It's right around Aventura, it's right around Miami Beach, it's right around Surfside. And it changes all the time. When I did the surf club in Surfside, or the Seaway, or the Arte, people always said, oh, nobody's gonna come to Surfside. Mm. Um, we drive fast through there to get to Bell Harbor, right. or to go to Miami Beach. Yeah. But really, it has become the destination to be, Surfside more so than ever before. Um, the problem is it's too small, it's too petite. What happens now is that it will, other areas in the neighborhood will get bigger, um, will be able to absorb it. And it's multi different venues. Uh, it's residential, it's commercial, it's mixed use, it's hotels. Um, so I'm optimistic about that. I like it very, very much. How would you be able to, to see like, you know, these buildings or these areas when people say, oh, Kobe, you know, it's never, it's never going to sell for this much or people are never going to come here. Like, like what gave you that grit, like that grind? So, you know what, I'm going to build this thing and you're going to buy it. I, I think that I was lucky enough to grow up like in the hospitality business in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. where the islands of Mastique or St. Lucia between the Pitons, we did the hotel that was originally called Jealousy Plantation or we did La Source in Grenada, or we did La Sport in St. Lucia, people always demanded in cold climates to go to the tropics for what they would seek is, you know, sea, sun, and sand. And even in Haiti, when it was still, we were able to do it, there was a club med there. One of the biggest club meds was outside um, on the beach, and it was very successful. But in reality, what happens is that as the trials and tribulations of life happens uh, and the politics don't let it go forward, it shuts down. So what we see is that there's a demand. Now, it just so happened that people have always knew about Florida. Oh, Florida is a great place. The weather is wonderful. We can come there. We can visit. Yeah. But now with the technology, I'm 60. How old are you now? 29. You're 30. So between, I'm 59, right? So there's a 60 to 30, there's a, a 30 year delta. And that delta is quite big. Right. When I was 30, I said to, oh, look, I always dealt with older women and older men. Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh, they're like my brothers and my sisters. Right. But really, when you get older, yeah. you start to see the time difference between 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and 50 to 60. Mm -hmm. Those are big bunches of years that you develop as an individual. Meaning if you have kids at, at, and the kids are five and seven years old, it's different than having 17 and 20 year old kids, right? It's just the way you perceive life is different. You, you got kids right now. 
two. Two. I okay. have, yeah, I have a 20 and a 26 year old this summer. So they they an architect or what what they're what they're one, doing? One wants to be in theater, um, and one wants to be in real estate. So they will be on the periphery of yeah. the architecture, but the business will continue with the people who run the business on a daily basis. Who are you passing the torch to? Whoever is whoever <laughs> wants it here. Uh, between your two kids, who? No, but between my two kids, I don't think that they will be architects. I think that they will help and manage the business. Right. But architects and designers within the company right. continue to run it forward. And they basically manage it and, and run with the brand and the name. And generally speaking, if you let the people who have been in the company, some of them have been here for two years, some have been here for 20 years, they run and manage the company and they move it forward and they make it successful in their own way. It has right. to take the next level of design. But to get back to you with the technology that we have today, mm -hmm. uh, just like this form that we're doing here, it's all digitized. It takes on a whole different level of communication. And so people are starting to see the opportunity to live and, and enjoy life, which it is a short life, in wherever it is that they want to. Some people love the mountains. Some people love to live in Alaska and go fishing. Some people like to grow up in the Northeast and enjoy the Four Seasons. But some people want to enjoy the Four Seasons in Florida in the, the surf club or the Four Seasons in Fort Lauderdale, which we designed, right? right. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it, it's just a different perception of life. And I think that Florida affords it, whether it's the East Coast or the West Coast, whether it's Naples or Tampa. Um, it's just a different communities, but it gives you a better quality of life to live in a better environment. And also as the world is getting more decarbonized, right? It's getting a smaller carbon footprint. People will desire to live in environmental and sustainable neighborhoods. And that's gonna make Florida um, become one of the more desired destinations in the United States. You know, I never asked you this Cole, but like, how did you grow up? Like you know, before you became an architect, like, like how was your parents? Like, how did you grow up? Do you have any siblings? Like, what was little Kobe's childhood memory like? So I grew up in Minneapolis mm. from age 12 till I was 24 when I moved to Miami. Okay. So my high school and my junior high and sixth grade, I grew up in uh, St. Louis Park, which is uh, near the urban center of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I grew up there in the 80s, um, late 70s. It was when Prince was alive and was just starting to come out. Right. And he played at, um, you know, the uh, um, First Avenue, which is a club right on the corner. Um, so we grew up together. We rode motorcycles together. But the Minneapolis was made of companies like IBM, 3M, Honeywell, Archer Daniels, Midland, Pillsbury, big companies that really set the Midwest in a very cool, calm, and collective American way of life. So for me, it was good. And before that, I was born in Israel in 1962. So Israel of 1962 until I left in 1974 was not necessarily the Israel of today. Today, it's very progressive. It's a first world country. You have the technology back then. You know, I didn't see a TV until I was 11 years old. So the, you grew up in the streets and um, it's nice to grow up in the streets. So you yeah. grew up in the streets. I grew up no in the TV. streets, no TV. We had a radio, <laughs> um, but it was a good life. It was an agrarian society and community. You know, there was oranges, there was fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, there was horses with, and donkeys and mules with um, carriages in the back carrying watermelons. So, but that's how I grew up. It was, a, wow. it was a Middle East country and it was a great place for me to grow up and I loved it. Um, but I love everywhere I go. You know, I lived in Alaska and I loved Alaska. I lived in the Caribbean, I loved the Caribbean. Uh, I lived in Minneapolis, and many people say, "Okay, I love Minneapolis." You know, yeah. I love I love the Midwest, and 
and uh, I had a great time growing up there. And you by yourself? Or you, uh, how many siblings you got? You know, I, I never asked you that question. Before. I have two sisters younger than me. Uh -oh. um, one is, you know, married with daughters, and one is um, single in Fort Lauderdale. But my sisters, again, they are kind of like me. They're strong. They would like to work, um, mm -hmm. and so they have always been serious in their path. So no brothers. No brothers. You ever wish you had an older brother? Like I, a... You know, I always had friends who were older than me yeah. who guide me and tell me, like, you're my relationship. Yeah. They always come to me, hey, Kobe, what do you think? Um, I always have that. I always had people in Grenada who were 10, 15, 20 years old, and they would tell me, this is what you should do, and this is how you should behave, and this is how you should sit and think and talk. And I think that God gave us, for a reason, two eyes and two ears and two nostrils and only one mouth, you know, so we can listen and hear and smell and feel more and talk less. And that gives you an opportunity to become a better human in this whole, you know, human race that we have around the world. Because when, you know, when you work in Cambodia, it's different than working in Vietnam. Right. Working in Vietnam is different than working in China, Southeast China, even though the weather is very similar the background of the people and the expectations of how you design and how you work is, is different from one community to the next, you know? So I think that also goes, you know, to Haiti, right? I mean, working yeah. in Port-au-Prince is different than working on the North Shore, and it's different than working in DR, which is right next door. Um, it's completely different. And I think that having that kind of an understanding helps you to go a long way forward in who you are as an individual from a selfish standpoint because the better person you can become in the community the better person you can become at work or the better person you can become in the family and just a better individual you can be overall and so in order to be successful at it right because life is trials and tribulations it's right. ups and downs right right and um you know i think that that's what makes life interesting so i'm getting that you didn't have any older brother, but you had older friends and older people who you called your brother that was able to like guide you and, yes. and be that that yes. you know that figure for you. I, I think that having older generation friends and and people around you and being able to relate and deal with people who are older when you were younger, to deal with older people. Is very important and the more you can communicate and listen and and think about it so when i was 10 i was able to communicate with people who are 20. Mm -hmm. 10 to 15 is a big delta from 20 to 30 if i can deal with people who are 30 was a big deal right and then i can learn a lot i was able to always listen to people who were 60 70 and 80 who looked at me like i was their son or their grandson and they would talk to me openly and I think if you have that ability to communicate, you can fall anywhere in the world. I mean, I can land in Abu Dhabi in 2005 and make friends and family. Just like that. Just like that. I can land in, in Bethel, Alaska, when I'm in you know, first or second year of college and just become part of the fabric of the community. And it's in every community, in every neighborhood you go to, it has its trials and tribulation. Bethel, Alaska, on the Kaskokwim River in 1983 when I was there, it's completely disengaged from the United States of America or the rest of Alaska. And there are disenfranchised individuals who live there who are mostly from Eskimo background. Mm. And they speak a language in Alaska called Yupik, right? Which is a completely different language. And you become part of the community and you live on the tundra. Uh, but, you know, many people think that Alaska is God's country. And some people believe it. And uh, when I was there, I thought so too. <laughs> I thought I, I got to heaven. Right. And then, um, but what is interesting is, you know, and I've, look, I, when I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we would have these school trips and we would go to the Caribbean, whether it was Mexico, Bahamas. And I thought, wow, this is really heaven. Yeah. Um, and so as you get older and wiser, you start to understand that there are many, many, many locations around planet earth 
that are just very, very special and unique destinations. I'll give you an example. I had a job to go to in uh, Luanda in Angola, right? So between Luanda, which is the capital, and the city we're working on, which is Keota, which is a drive further south, um, there's just you drive through the landscape and the environment and the trees, and you see things that you really appreciate, especially at sunrise or sunset, you know? Um, and, and I think it's important as an individual to go and visit other locations, other countries around the world to number one, humble you and understand, you know, that the world you live in is just a microcosm of the overall reality. Right. And the same thing with design and architecture of what we do. You know, the way we design in Alaska, obviously with igloos and uh, porta potties is different than the way we design in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it's completely different than the way we design in, the, in, in, in Florida or the Caribbean, right? So the, it was just a whole different breadth and understanding of design that helped me. Well, that's, uh, I, I really didn't know that. We know each other for like a few years now. I yes. didn't. Well, it's the first time we were really talking. You were really talking like that, right? <laughs> you come to my home so I, <laughs> right? I can talk. So cool. You know I'm an athlete, not a developer, because of you. Uh, so what's the, you know, athletes, we're, we're competitive. We got that grit, that chip on our shoulder, and we like to win. <laughs> you smile because you know I'm about to ask you. <laughs> so <laughs> what is, like, all the greats have that, and I always, like, look at you as, you're like the Michael Jordan, LeBron James of architect, as the Tom Brady is the football. So what is like being in your shoes and like, what is that chip on your shoulder that, that got you started and say, you know what, this is what I'm doing? So look, that's an interesting question, right? But for me personally, yeah. um, the chip on the shoulder, it's, I was always like scared, right? I'm always scared that I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not uh, uh, doing the best that I can whether it's with the people or the project. Um, and even now, right? Like you got three cameras, right? Yeah. Which one should I be looking at? Which one should I be talking to? Which one can I carry the punchline to, to carry the message across? And now today with the TikToks and the Instagram of the world, you have an availability to hear more people talk like I'm talking to you now, which is why I took this meeting, is that I think that Ever since I was young, I've had this, you call it the desire or the burn, right? But really what it is, it's the paranoia on, on the individual character, um, that you're doing the best that you can. And what happens if, if um, the market um, goes downhill and you don't have enough work to sustain the, you know, the 100 people that you have working for you and working with you in the office? How do you sustain them and how do you not lay them off, right? So we have been through the trials and tribulations of the real estate, because real estate goes like this. Mm. And in Florida, it goes like this, is that we've been able to find ways to have work when the market contracts. So whether we go to Abu Dhabi in the year seven, eight, nine, ten, or we go and we do a lot of workforce affordable housing, or we do work for projects that are in Honduras or Grenada or El Paso, Texas, right? We, I personally, see that there is always a demand um, to fill a hole where there is a market. And Many people did not want to work in Miami Beach because of the historic preservation and restoration and they thought it was problematic. I took it as an opportunity to provide the community a preservation and restoration of a building and come through that building to the new building. Was he scared? It was scary because I don't know if other people will believe and receive your thought. And it's kind of like throwing a Hail Mary and hoping that the receiver on the other side will catch it, right? Yeah. And, and, and if you're successful, they do. But 
I can tell you, I was in Las Vegas, you know, when I was <laughs> in 19, whatever it is, I was in high school, 1980 or so, and it was like Thomas Kramer, I mean, Minnesota Vikings never yeah. went to the Super Bowl, right? They got a Super Bowl one. <laughs> Thomas Kramer, number 10, throws a Hail Mary to um, the receiver, which is Ahmad Rashad. Very good receiver. Yeah. And he fumbled it, right? And so the intent was there to receive it. Mm. The intent was there to throw it. And it was almost caught. So you need to close that transaction. And so what I'm, and just like football, I gave you an analogy. Yeah. You come up with a thought and an idea. Yeah. We did a building, you know, called the Caribbean on 37th and Collins, and we preserved the historic building so we can build a new one next to it. What well, we bring you into the historic building and introduce you to your grandparents and your foremothers and your forefathers before you bring you into the new building. Mm -hmm. And it creates a certain ambiance. We do the same thing at the surf club. We preserved and restored a historic building and we bring you into the new building. Um, and I like to do things that give something to the community so the community can come in and say, wow, I did not know this was here before me. And it creates a dialogue in architecture and design because yes, most we are architects and we like to create something new, but it's built on something from the past. Mm. And by studying the history of architecture, the history of art, it allows you to come into the next level of design, um, which exists and procures a better project. And whether we do historic preservation, like I just showed you, or we do environmental and sustainable, or we do designs that are based on the culture of the community to make a building that is different. Meaning the building we do in Bahamar, Fort Lauderdale is different than the building we do on the Miami River. And it's different than the building we just got approved in North Miami, um, which is a multifamily residential allure. And they're all very nice buildings that I'm proud of. And they're different than the affordable housing that I would do in Overtown across from Red Rooster, but it's a beautiful building. People come in and they go, wow, that's a great building. And I'm proud to be part of that design in that context, because I think if you are looking at the history or you're looking at the community or you're looking at the story of the fabric, whether you're in Abu Dhabi or you're in Mecca, we have a hotel under construction in Mecca. We're one of the few Americans building in wow. Mecca, right? It's, wow. it's great now to build in Saudi and in Abu Dhabi. Many people have done it, but we are architects in Abu Dhabi registered as well as in Mecca. To, it's an honor to build in that community, to be part of that community. How did you, like you said, you were, you're registered to build in Abu Dhabi. So, you know, you told me before, like you work with the uh, royal family. So how, how did you create that relationship and how did you like get into, you know, building you know, for the Abu Dhabi family. How did you do that? I got involved in that um, by, again, by listening <laughs> rather than talking mm. and listening and then thinking because <clears throat> my thought, I grew up in Israel. So my intention was not necessarily, as an American growing up in the United States of America, most Americans are not programmed to travel a lot. Mm. We're happy where we are. We don't travel very much. Um, now, they're asking me to come to Abu Dhabi, which in 2005 was different than it is today, yeah. right? Today, it, we're what, 20, 22. So it's like, you know, 15 years. Um, but when I landed in Abu Dhabi and we started to do work in Abu Dhabi, I saw the potential and the need and the demand for architects. So they asked me to be an architect of record as well as a design architect there. And that's what we became. We opened up offices and we did housing for Etihad Airlines. Back then, nobody knew who Etihad Airlines is. Mm -hmm. We did the housing. Um, we did uh, a wildlife park and resort, 900 hectare master plan in El Ain. Um, so you start to work for the family with the family indirectly. You know, in Abu, in, and so we just continuously expanded. And part of the money investment in Abu Dhabi comes from Saudi. So they say, you know, if you're working here, why don't you please come to our home? And so I work on the Red Sea and I work in um, 
Riyadh and other locations. But really, we work in Bahrain, we work in Doha, Qatar. So it's a community. And everybody kind of knows everybody directly and indirectly. So from 2005 until 2011, 12, which is a period of seven years, we were quite busy as the oil was also escalating in price. So the money was there to invest. And there was a demand, a strong demand, um, to build in that location. So we supplied the demand by being there physically. Um, we had an office in El Raha Beach, which is on one location in the historic part of Abu Dhabi, um, behind the gold uh, souk, behind the gold market, um, and in El Ain. So we were an hour away from one office, branch office, to another because traffic was just horrendous. Yeah. Yet technology was getting set up where you can have servers and you can email and print shops. And it's a very pro-business community. So print shops are open 24-7 and people are meeting you at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the, the reason people like to work also at night, it's, it's cooler, especially if you work June, July, August. Temperatures are 110, 130 in the shade. Easy. So you want to work at night, right? You have a desire to work at night and, and, and be um, alert, especially since you are um, eight hours um, behind the United States. So if the office in the United States is open, you know, 12 noon here in Miami is, you know, quite late there, right? It's, right. it's 8, 9, 10 p.m. Yeah. So we liked to work into the evening and we were able to produce a lot and provide a great service. And in, that's how we ended up in Saudi. That's how we ended up in Mecca. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor for them as an inclusive community to bring an American company um, into a location to work with a joint venture in Saudi. It's, it's really um, a pleasant experience. And it's different than working, for example, in um, at the same time, in, we work in the Far East, in Cambodia, Vietnam, Southeast China, which is tropical, so it's more like Florida. Or we work in locations which are more arid, because we work in Vegas. Right. We did one Las Vegas, we did other projects in Vegas. So to work in other locations, such as Saudi and Abu Dhabi, it has the same kind of DNA in, in, mm. in the um, climate. But... We also work in Cape Town, South Africa. We just finished a project in Cape Town, multifamily residential, in a district called Muli Point, which is where you can have the historic lighthouse right in front, but you can see the whales um, as they're traveling um, north and south by coming around the Cape. So that's I'm, kind of a- I'm jealous here. I haven't been to Africa yet. <laughs> you, you, beat, you beat me. You need to go <laughs> to that continent because it's, it's a unique destination and it makes you understand why it is where, you know, civilizations came from. Because it's a very agrarian, potential, good, hospitable place for people to live. The weather is good. And then you say, oh, as civilization got smarter and better and they were able to hunt and keep themselves warm, they can go into cooler climates, right? But being in the Mediterranean or the Middle East, you can understand why that is the cradle of civilization and why it started. It's a place where you can sleep outside. Look, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. When I was studying architecture, people would tell me, you're never going to make any money as an architect. You're going to be broke. So you might as well work construction, which is what I did. Or you might as well work laying railroad ties for a landscaping company, which I did. Or you might as well build little cardboard models we used to build. I was very good at building cardboard models. But that got me into the office atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to figure out how to work and how to make money in an office rather than out in the field. But I have a GC license in the state of Florida just, you know, because I never knew where the future is going to be. Really? So I um, think that there is that kind of a thought process that makes you understand that you know, if, God forbid, you can't make money in Minneapolis, Minnesota, sleeping outside in Minneapolis in January is not, is not you can't. You can't survive. But in Miami, you can sleep outside. Right. In, 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 you can sleep, <laughs> yeah, 365 days out of the year, you can find a place to sleep outside 
and and be and not die, not freeze overnight. And that is important because when you think like that, it creates that you call it the chip on your shoulder. Yeah. But some people call it a survival mode. And if you have that desire, whether it's athletics or education, to have a survival mode, I think it's very important. Because I think that the most important thing I can do for my children is advance them as quick as possible to understand that I may not be around forever. Nobody's around forever. Mm. We all come and go like the sand. Mm. And the period of time that we're here, we have to enjoy every second, not every moment, every second. Because at the end of the day, you never know. Yeah. You know, when, when your time is up, and for whatever you know reason. So the more you can in, instill that within individuals, the better the individual becomes, therefore the better the community becomes, therefore the better the society becomes. I was happy to grow up in Israel in the 60s until the 70s, because I thought it was a good time for me to grow up there. I was very happy to grow up in Minneapolis, Minnesota from 1974 until 1988 when I left. Those were important years in, in the United States of America. The United States of America in 1974 was in tough economic shape. Mm. Um, also, it, it was just a different economic fortune that people looked at. People looked at architects as superfluous businesses, right? They, they, they were not a necessary business because people didn't have money to build luxury homes and luxury hotels and, and, and luxury this and luxury that. They needed architects or regimented, um, necessary, boxy office buildings and or housing, which is reflective of what was built in the United States of America in the 70s and 80s. But what was starting to be built in the late 90s or 2000 or 2010s, and now in the 20s, it's different in the United States of America. And not only in the USA, but everywhere around the world. Uh, because to, historically in the past 20 years, the world is closer together, especially through technology, more so than ever before. You talked about like architects was not really a big thing back in the day. So if you and people doubted you, you know, for you to be an architect, I mean, you definitely proven everybody wrong. Um, if you weren't an architect today, what would you have been? I would have been in the construction business. I would have been in something to do with the construction and or the design business. I mean, there is a lot that can be done, whether it's building buildings, building houses, landscaping, um, supplying materials. Supplying. So you would have been the guy that would have been hammering and... I was. I was in the field. You did actual labor. I, I was act, did actual construction labor, actual landscaping. Um, and. I did everything. I cut grass. I mowed lawns. I worked for a landscaping company. Back when lawnmowers didn't, were not even automatic. You know, today you have automatic. They go forward. <laughs> Back then you had to push them. <laughs> but, um, no, but in all seriousness, that's what it is. And, you know, whether it's in the winters, you shovel snow. You shovel snow so you can get paid on per driveway or per sidewalk. But at the same time, you have to look at it not only as a business, but you have to look at it as what is it you're doing to people, right? Mm -hmm. Some people needed me to shovel their driveway so they can get out easy. Some people need me to drive, shovel their sidewalk because they were old, mm -hmm. right? So you shovel the driveway, but then there's ice. So you, with an ice pick, you remove the ice. So when they come out to get the mail at the mailbox, they don't slip and slide and or fall or break something. And then you, if you understand that, then you are understanding your demand and your market. But more important, you understand with your two ears and your two eyes, what people are telling you and asking you to do so you can do it properly. Because if you don't do it properly, people will fall, slip and die and they will not be your client anymore. You want them to survive and be healthy and be successful. And that kind of a thought process of assisting people to make a living and to make a business and to make development or to make a clean sidewalk, right? A clean path is is not only detrimental to their welfare and to their health and to their life safety but it's also detrimental for your well-being you will have a job to come back next snowfall um, and and do it again and they will wait for you and they'll pay you nicely for it and and they'll give you a tip and 
you know, they'll give you a sweatshirt or something like that, right? Yeah. That, that's the kind of things that make a big difference. And if you're a teenager and you understand that and you can feel it, then you go through life doing that, right? Because I think that that's important to carry through. Because many, many times assisting other people, you're really assisting yourself. And the more people I can assist, the more people that really in the end assist me. Because it creates an inherent community and loyalty, generally speaking. Not all people are good, but no. the majority are good. Right. Not all people are mean well or have a good heart and a good mind. Yeah. But the majority of the population does. And even if sometimes people have gotten off the track, I believe that like baseball, you need to give them three tries. Some people say, no, once done and gone. That's it. <laughs> right? Me, my mentality is, no, I'll give them three tries. You know? So you give people chances. You give them. I get up to three. Three, up to three. Yeah, I learned that in the American uh, sports, which is baseball. Yeah. Oh, so you're a baseball fan? No, I'm a baseball watcher. <laughs> I watch um, softball and baseball, and yeah. I think that giving and uh, you know, three times is at, um, at the bat is an opportunity because sometimes you miss, sometimes you didn't pay attention, sometimes you're asleep at the wheel, and sometimes you know you, you need to come back. I have failed before, mm. and mm. not because I didn't try, I failed. What was your failure? Many, I failed every day. I fail every day, all the time, on multiple occasions, whether it's um, work-related or personal relationships or you know, you fail um, because you don't have all the data and information all the time to provide the solution. But part of success, a huge part of success is failure. If yeah. I succeed, that's only the tip of the iceberg. The iceberg that sits below the water, that's the failure part. You fail all the time and that's how you get better. And that's how you figure it out. Oh, trust me, I didn't know how to pick ice off of a sidewalk, I thought I would do it with a shovel. No, I had to go buy an ice pick and then, you know, I had to learn. So those are the kind of things that trials and tribulations in life that you go through. And I think that is part of what makes me always desire to work with other people. And I like, you know, I've worked with other architects in the past, I've helped them, um, especially older ones. Who's your, uh... You know, the architect that you looked up to that you, you say, you know what, I want to be like this guy or I want to surpass this architect. Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright um, has always been sort of my inspiration as an architect because he was around the turn of the century as an architect. He From he, Miami? No, from? he was from the Midwest. He started the Prairie School of Architecture in Wisconsin, which was American architecture built on the natural environment, natural materials in a contemporary modern fashion of the time. So he created uh, the Prairie School, and it's very well known, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and I like that direction and how it fits into the nature and environment and how it fits into the community. And I took that Prairie School of Architecture as my inspiration, which is different than traditional um, architecture and or just modern architecture. It's more contextual, mm. so I like that. Well, so let me ask you, you traveled all over the world, you've seen so many things, and you know, I gotta ask you this question because we all, you know, we all look to this, you know, in our personal lives. So how it was for you dating, and how did you end up meeting Mrs. Clark? And what was you, you said you failed in your personal life, so what was your failed relationships, and how did you, you know, get her like to be to hold your last name, and hmm. how did it all happen, man? Get, well, get, get, I, tell me the tea. I need I, it. I met, I, well, I met Nancy while I was working in the Caribbean. I was actually working in Jamaica and St. Lucia at that period of time, and I would work during the week in the Caribbean. And so, what happens is that um, on the weekends we'd come back to Miami for Friday night, Saturday night. So I met her. And um, we started to date, and she actually you came. You made the first move, or she? Um, or she did. You know, it's it's the old story. You know, <laughs> I I have two ears and two eyes, and she was talking to a friend of mine all night, and I thought to myself, oh, I like the way she's thinking. You know, she's bright and strong and smart, and yeah. so it's good. 
And so I asked her out at the end of the night. He, he did all the talking. Just, <laughs> you just, just listen. I just listened. And she said, no, she had a boyfriend at the time. And she said, no, I can't. And I said, okay. But then a week or two later, I came back to the same spot. And she came looking for me. And that's when we started to connect. But, you know, it's, again, it's, it's like trial and error, you know? And you never know in life. And part of success is the failure, right? You need to have the failure and you need to accept the failure and you need to learn from failures to become more successful um, because that's the only way you'll be able to advance yourself. You, it, and it's practice, 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 practice all the time. Mm. And that's what I still do. And that's how I continuously get better. I cannot, you can't stay, you never stay static. You're, you're always moving. And if you're not improving yourself, you're devaluating yourself. But in reality, what is interesting is that, and so we dated and we went out. She came to Jamaica. She'll tell you a story. You know, she delivered, I was working on a project in Jamaica for, um, in Carinoso, which is Enchanted Gardens, which is a property off the water, but it's beautiful landscaped area. And she, came to the airport, I told her, just go to the airport, there'll be somebody there to meet you. And, yeah. <laughs> and they came with a letter, okay. which is basically to let this Brazilian Blue Bahia marble to go through to the hotel we were doing, to the project we were doing in uh, Enchanted Gardens in, outside Ocho Rios. And so gives her a letter, she said, okay, thank you. And she, gets, she was basically the courier, right? <laughs> and so she comes and she lands in Jamaica. And there's containers, right, of this blue bay here that gets loaded up. And she'll tell you the story, you know, and I used to live there and I had a stick Toyota and the floor is missing, you know, and she thought that she would come to Jamaica in the Toyota. She thought that she'd come to Jamaica and she'd be living like, yeah. And then she saw how, because when you work, you, you're working. You're yeah. not there as a tourist. Of course. And, um, it's real. It's real. And, uh, that's it. So that's how we met. And, you know, as life goes on, we have kids and, you know, you develop and you grow together and you, the person you marry is not the same person you are or they are 10 years later or 20 years later. We've been together for 30 years. Wow. Yeah. So, and under American system of rules and regulations, um, that's the way we have been for the past 30 years. Wow. Does she work with you or? She runs the business. So arguably I work for her. <laughs> it's my name on the door, but nobody knows if Kobe Carp is an individual or a company or nobody knows yeah. what it means. Uh, you know me as a person, yeah. but many people have never, today they Google it, right? So, oh, yeah. that's an actual individual. But that will not continue in perpetuity. Eventually, mm. you know, hopefully, uh, the company continues and the person disappears and then it just continues as a name and a brand. You know, Pillsbury is a name, but the Pillsbury who made the company is no longer around. Mm. Um, you know, but sometimes it does not continue. Frank Lloyd Wright was around, but when he went away, the company went away. So you kind of never know where it's going to end up. Wow. And the last thing I want to ask you, you know, I never asked you this question before. So. You know, to this day, people don't really believe or they're so shocked that, like, I have access to you like this. Mm -hmm. Like, we're like friends. Like, you're my mentor. You're my brother. Like, you're like another dad or something to me. I text you. You respond right back. Like, you know, you've done billions of dollars worth of real estate. Believe it or not, you contacted me. So I responded and we started to speak and we had a conversation. So if there is a challenge and a thought process on the other side, I engage. But many times, you know, if people are just wasting time, I'm not into that. Mm -hmm. So whether it's somebody who's older or somebody that's younger or anybody, I don't like to waste time because time is the most valuable commodity we have. Yeah. And so when you contacted me, you were looking at a property that is historic in the historic district. And I felt that that specific property on that plot, if you're able to do what it is that you thought you can do, it will be good for the community. And then that's when the neighbors and the historic people called us up, remember, oh yes, it's a good idea. Yeah. And they were supporting us and the CT staff was supporting us. Mm -hmm. And it really created arguably the most value on the property because you bought it right. Yeah. You're gonna fix it up right. 
and you'll be able to sell it or lease it right. So you have created a value where others did not believe in you. Now, it doesn't mean that you have a lot of experience. The person who came to me who did the Four Seasons Hotel came from, born in Africa from a Lebanese family, never built anything wow. ever in mm. Florida. But he bought a note of a project that we did called the Capri, which had a basement and had a new condo and a historic building next to it in Miami Beach called the Capri. He showed up on a Vespa and we met and other developers were calling me up, but he had a nice direction and idea, which was the preservation and restoration of the historic and building new, which then we did the hotel and then we made, the, you know, other developments on it. So when I have an ability to listen to people and see how I can make it work, and create a value, I enjoy it. Well, I mean, it means so much to me because like we've done projects together and like every project that we've touched, we've never lost, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know, and I, and I really appreciate you, man, for that. It's my pleasure. And, um, you know, it allows me to like to pour into other people. And, um, you know, I know we've got a project we're doing now. So if you got, I, know, I don't know if you got time, but you know, we can go look at it to see the progress, what we're doing, so. I would love to, not yeah. not, not today, I ain't gonna be but today. I'm sure that this weekend or whenever you want, I'd love yeah. to spend some time like we always did. You know, yeah. we come meet on a Saturday or Sunday, walk the property together. Like you you and, come in with flip flops and yes. shorts, like you going to the beach. <laughs> I, I, I go to the beach after I'm done with you. Yeah. <laughs> cool. I really Thank you, my friend. You, my brother. Love you. And love you too, man. Try to overlook a rival. Cause I got no competition Now looking at an idol You're doing long enough to pay for my attention